indigenous ways of being. Global Exploration. Good morning. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Islands of Azores. I want to thank uh, the Explorers Club. It is a great pleasure for my son, Skylar, who is an emerging explorer, and I to be here. Um, so I'd love to take you on a little journey, journey into culture. So here we are, just imagine floating above the planet. When I was born in 1958, the world's population was three billion people. It is now eight billion people and counting. Every day, 200 species go extinct. Every two weeks, a traditional language dies with the passing of an elder. There are 6,000 languages on the planet, and 85% of those are oral. So when that elder passes away, if that information has not been passed on to the younger generation by stories and mythology, it is, as my great friend Wade Davis says, like burning down the Library of Congress every two weeks. By 2050, over 70% of the world's population will live in urban areas. Every day, four billion images get uploaded onto the internet. Clearly, the planet is at an inflection point. Some would say under great duress. But there are places, sacred places, that still exist under the forest canopy or deep in the grasslands of Mongolia. People and places that still dance to the ancient rhythms of spirits and forces from our past. That people that live hidden under uh, the canopies of the forests and the deserts of the Sahara Desert that are withstanding the tsunami of modernity. Today, I would like to take you on a journey to some of those places. Several de decades ago, I had the great privilege and honor of going to New Guinea. New Guinea is a Stone Age culture that live on an island just north of Australia. I had grown up in Australia as a young kid, and my father spoke of this mythical land to the north where there were still people that did the rituals of ancient cultures, where masks still danced and where the rituals of life and birth and death were still unfolding. I went there first in 1985, fell in love with the concept of traveling deep into the jungle. I would often take a dugout canoe for months on end or simply buy a one-way ticket on a small little Cessna up into the highlands and start walking. Over a 10-year period that I lived in New Guinea, I systematically worked my way around uh, the archipelago of New Guinea, which is divided in half between the western part, which is a part of Indonesia, West Papua, and the eastern part, which of course is Papua New Guinea, which gained its independence in 1975 from, uh, as an Australian protectorate. So what I found were these amazing, amazing different tribal groups. As a visual anthropologist, my mission was to put on film these cultures from our past living in the present for future generations. The power of photography to be not only an archive, but a catalyst for future generations to begin to do their dances again. Early in the trip, I was way up in the highlands walking along a trail when I saw this old man. He had this beautiful plumage of birds of paradise feathers. And just to the left was a tree full of birds. And through my translator, and of course you needed to use translators there, um, I asked a very Western question. How many birds in the tree? Translator talk to the old man, they talk back and forth, and in a very embarrassed tone, my guide said to me, we don't have words for numbers. 
my first immediate reaction was, well, what a primitive, and then I stopped. What do they see that we don't see? What do they hear that we have lost touch with? What does their world reveal to them without numbers and Western commodities and quantities? I decided I needed to go further into the forest and learn to ask the right questions. In our culture, we are naturally ethnocentric. We see the world the way we want to see it. But traveling and certainly living with indigenous cultures, you begin to realize there are multiple realities. There are multiple forms of wisdom. There are multiple levels of priority. We in the West look at the world in a very different way. There is a huge knowledge base, database out there that we are ignoring, and especially in the time of climate change, it is imperative that we add more chairs to the table of the discussion of how we survive beyond the 21st century. About halfway through the trip, I had heard there was a young man who's going to be initiated. And so the day before this image was taken, I had been hiking for several weeks. I came up and over the top of that mountain, came down to the bottom, huffed and puffed my way up to a little area to camera right. And there was an old man sitting there, smiling as I came up. And I sat down beside him, took a drink of water, and then through my translator, he said, which valley are you from? And I smiled because in New Guinea, literally, many of the tribes don't even leave their own valley. There's over a thousand languages, not dialects, thousand languages on the island of New Guinea. So it is entirely possible that that old man had never journeyed out of that valley, and for all practical purposes, a white person could be living in the next valley. He kept persisting, which valley are you from? And I smiled and I said, many valleys away. And he said, no, which valley are you from? And then he stopped, he paused, he looked up at the sky and he said, I know, you're from where the green meets the blue. And I thought about that. And I thought, yes. Not only is he referring to a story, a myth he had heard of the hills end and it's the color of the ocean, but we're all from where the green meets the blue. We're all from this fragile planet spinning out in the universe. And in fact, about 10 years ago, I was speaking at a TED conference, did my lecture, and then the last female astronaut up in the um, space station got up and lectured. And then she backstage came running up to me and said, you know, you're right. I used to sit up in that space station look down at the earth and then look out into infinity and then look back at the earth and say, this fragile planet where the green meets the blue, we need to pay more attention. We need to save this fragile, finite planet that we live on. Near the end of the trip, I had the great fortune that explorers have had over centuries to be a part of an expedition that made first contact with an indigenous culture that had never experienced white culture before. There's a part of New Guinea called the Bird's Head up in the northwest part. The maps, I love maps that say no data available. That's where I like to go. And sure enough, we hiked in about three weeks and we discovered a tribe that had never had outside contact. We spent 10 remarkable days sitting around fireplaces at night, sharing the stories of what it means to be human, what it means to be alive, what it means to not be connected to the tsunami of modernity. What it means to be human are the questions of, what is your family? How many children do you have? What is your village like? And that was a beautiful, beautiful experience. So after 10 days, we packed up our cameras, packed up our recorders, gave everybody hugs, sitting there in a late afternoon, the kids frolicking around, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and then all of a sudden a storm came rolling up the hill. 
and they put on their very fashionable banana raton umbrellas, and suddenly the storm cleared, the sun was going down, and I thought, this is a beautiful moment. I'm trying to hold on to this. And I looked up, I cast my eyes up into the sky, and some 30,000 feet above me was a jet streaming across, probably had taken off from Sydney or Darwin, was on its way to Bangkok or Hong Kong. And I thought, what a remarkable time to be alive. What a remarkable time for all of us to be alive at this crossroads of human evolution, that deep down when we've always looked out the window at those forests or those deserts below, there's still people alive to beating with the ancient heartbeat still with one foot in the Garden of Eden. It is a privilege for all of us to be alive today where there are many cultures with thousands of generations of knowledge still existing. So several years ago, after I left New Guinea, I found myself in the western part of Mongolia with the Cossacks, with the eagle hunters. And I was working to document a lot of their disappearing traditions. However, there's a great revitalization going on. We were about five days horseback in from the roads, no electricity except this little village had a generator. And so we went and we stayed and we connected and I wanted to work with them and photograph them. But what I often do is I will stay a long time without my cameras to connect to them, to give them a sense of real kind of communication and build levels of trust and friendship. So we had scouted this location up on the hill. It was late afternoon, they came running up on their horsebacks, sat this gentleman down, and what I like to do as a photographer is first to take a photograph of them with my iPad so I can share it with them and that helps kind of build yet another level of trust. So I took this photograph, showed it to him, and in very broken English, he said, oh, I'd, I'd like a copy of that image. And I said, sure. So what I did was I took out my piece of paper, started writing it out, and he went, no, 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 no. Airdrop it to me and I'll put it on FaceTime. <laughs> and why not? Why can we not live in a world where everybody connects to technology? Who are we to say, no, you shouldn't be doing that? Everybody is connecting around the world. Six billion images a day are being uploaded. And I think that is so important in the 21st century that people have that connection. I'm the director of a global foundation, Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation, and that's exactly what we do. We work at the nexus of traditional knowledge conservation and climate mitigation. There are many traditional cultures that not only are on the front line, but hu have huge amounts of knowledge around the true meaning of sustainability. Sustainability through empirical evidence over tens of thousands of years. We need to access that. So that's what we do, is we combine technology, we go where we're invited, and we also deal with conservation issues and our sponsors like Apple and Cisco connect these traditional cultures. So a shaman in East Africa can be talking to an eagle hunter on the savanna grasslands of Mongolia, and why not? So as the chainsaws fell the last trees that hide the first people and the bulldozers plow over the last of the sacred earth, we are alive at an amazing moment in human evolution. That rich tapestry of human culture, that fabric that is made up of the dazzling array of man's diversity is truly at a cru crucial crossroads. Will we as a species let go and sever that fragile umbilical cord to our primeval past, finding ourselves truly alone without cultural purpose a drift in a vast sea of space with nowhere to go? Or will we make a different choice? 
It is my hope that we will all gather around the fireplace of humanity and continue for generations to tell the stories of what it means to be alive on a planet that has survived the 21st century. I'd like to end my lecture this morning with a quote by Margaret Mead, the great social anthropologist. She said her greatest fear, having been born into a polychromatic world, was that her grandchildren, indeed all of our children, will one day wake up in a monochromatic world and never know there was anything else. Thank you very much.